The subject of uh, this Fader talk is loyalty to world. I think that uh, for me at least this was one of the more uh, complex faders, but hopefully with a couple of examples everything will become clearer. So, what do we mean by loyalty to world? The basic uh, kind of uh, trade-off in this fader is between plausibility and playability. What plausibility means is that the world of the game should be like consistent and make sense and to be understandable that, that you think oh, this is the logic of the world and that's how it always works in the game. And that's plausibility, that the world is believable. And the playability means that the LARP should work as well as possible uh, in game terms, that it should be a well-designed, good game. And uh, sometimes there is no conflict between these two values, but quite often there is. So what's best for the game makes no sense in terms of the world. Yeah, and uh, to sort of explain what that in concrete terms means, I have an example from the Monitor Celestron. So, in the world of Battlestar Galactica, there's uh, people serving in the colonial fleet who belong to a very, like a military hierarchy. This was the kind of character I also played myself in the Monitor Celestron. So you play like a what would be in real, real world maybe a navy officer, so a soldier basically. And the problem with playing a character who is part of that kind of a hierarchy is that it's often can be extremely boring because uh, you don't you have to like uh, follow orders and uh, do stuff that's not like super exciting. And uh, for example, you you might have to I don't know guard a toilet for eight hours, stuff like this. Uh, and which makes a lot of sense if you want to make your military machine work efficiently, but it's not like excellent if you want to have a good LARP experience. <laughs> so to sort of fix this problem and make Celestro playable at the expense of the believability of the world, uh, there were a couple of uh, couple of uh, design choices that were made. I'm using the passive tense here because most of them were not made by the designers, but by us. <laughs> One of these uh, design choices was uh, extreme delegation. What this means is that the guy playing the highest ranking commanding officer, which is the guy on the right, he said that uh, the way this is going to work is that if you play a, an officer in the colonial fleet, like I did, you can make choices without asking him. You can make decisions on your own and then he will pretend that he gave those orders. This way I, can t I don't have to ask him every time I want to take initiative. I can just go out there and do stuff. And then later on he will say, yes, I will support this 100%. And that makes my game much more playable because I don't have to constantly like wait on him. But instead I can just go out and do things. But you can obviously see that real-life military hierarchies don't always work like this. <laughs> that the commanding officer just sort of says, yes, yes, go and play. <laughs> this doesn't really make a lot of sense in terms of the world, but it was very good for the game. And uh, another solution, it was a very simple one, which we also came up with, was the one-hour rule. And the one-hour rule was that, uh, was that uh, when you gave an order, you must guard this door. The order could not last for more than one hour. So that, uh, and of course the point of this was that guarding the door for one hour can be like, okay, I'm a soldier, I will now do some soldiering. This is great for the LARP. But after I do it for more than one hour, I start to get, uh, okay, why, why am I here? So that's why no tasks that are too long, so that things don't get boring. And uh, of course what this requires is kind of rotation that uh, if somebody really has to do it, then just people take turns. But quite often also, there doesn't actually have to be a guy at the door anyway. So it's uh, more just a kind of a gesture. But that's a very basic trade-off between 
uh, plausibility and playability. And here the sort of uh, choice was to always make things uh, less realistic at the expense of uh, no at the expense of realism to make it make it more interesting. But uh, realism is actually kind of uh, often very closely tied to this. The idea of realism is closely tied to this idea of uh, plausibility, because even I've noticed that even in a, even in a situation like uh, Celestra, where the LARP is based on Battlestar Galactica, people think, ah, oh, but it, it would be realistic for us to do this or that or that, even if the setting is completely fictional. And when people say realism, I think what they mean is plausible. And uh, often the kind of a very common, I'm just going to call it a mistake in these kinds of games, is to go with the maximum realism and say that uh, it would be realistic for everybody to just guard the doors for eight hours. But don't do that. So I have another, maybe a little bit more abstract example of how, uh, how this works. Uh, in Halat Hisar, we had a uh, resistance to occupying power was one of our one of our themes, and uh, resisting an occupation is a skill, uh, like a player skill. People can have this skill or they don't have this skill, and uh, players' life experience affects the design and outcome of whatever happens in the game. In the picture right there, we see a, a Palestinian player resisting the occupation by uh, throwing a buffer stone. And, uh, What's a buffer stone? Buffer stone is a fake stone that's made soft, like a soft stone, so that you can hit people in the face with it without uh, causing the effect that a real stone would cause. <laughs> and uh, if, if, if you look at the photo, you will see that this man is alone in the photo. There's no crowd around him. And that's because every time, or not every time, but most of the times, uh, resisting started to happen. You could see there was always a couple of people sort of ahead of everybody else. And they were always the Palestinians. <laughs> and uh, the situation here is that uh, the Palestinian players played like uh, journalists and NGO workers. And at least to my understanding, in real life occupation situations, the journalists and the NGO workers are not the first at the front lines <laughs> doing stuff. Uh, even and, and I think that uh, and I think that uh, it's a question of but but they played those characters and it was for us it was a playability choice it was a design choice to give those characters to them to make the game work but it created an outcome which was that uh, in our game for some reason the natives the Finns were really bad at resisting and the foreigners were really great at resisting <laughs> and that uh, uh, um, lowered the plausibility of the game. Our uh, solution to this problem, which we sort of identified beforehand, was to, by the way, it's supposed to be read like a workshopping resistance, like practicing resistance, not resisting workshops. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but was to practice it so that uh, our Finns could sort of go up to the level of our uh, Palestinian players. Uh, they, got, they didn't get up to the level, but like a little bit higher in these uh, exercises we did to take care of this. So, when we look at this sort of uh, maximum position of, of uh, loyalty to world, everything is, uh, everything is as uh, plausible as possible. The great advantages here is that the world makes sense. And you can improvise within this world that makes sense maybe a little bit easier because you understand the rules of the world and you see, feel, feel like it's a real environment. And a real like a, the social rules make sense. Our characters are where they should be. My colonial officer is doing his colonial officer stuff in a proper environment. And it's coherent. But the problems can be that the gameplay may not be so exciting. By bad gameplay, I mean guarding the toilet. As a soldier for eight hours, it can be boring. Maybe it doesn't work so well as a LARP. But the important question here is to think that where is the focus of the game? And what's important for the focus? Is it the gameplay? Is it the world? Or what's important? And uh, in my experience, the sort of max position for uh, plausibility 
is I think most common maybe in uh, in many historical games because in those games exploring the world and the ideas of the world are very important so it, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit boring because uh, that's not the point. The point is not to be like super excited all the time. The point is that you see how the world works, what everyday life is in this world, what kind of food people eat is in this world, and so on. And experiencing those everyday things might be so interesting in the long, in the bigger picture, that it makes sense to just disregard playability and go with maximum plausibility to make the environment real. And. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, I think the historical games are not the only examples of this, but uh, but the most typical. And then at the other end, you can just go with the disregard ideas of the world most uh, completely, and go with uh, what's like fun and interesting and cool to play in terms of uh, game mechanics, in terms of game design, and, uh, and things like that. And the advantages here is that uh, you can just uh, play around with cool stuff and uh, make people do interesting things. It's easier to follow design ideas and, uh, and uh, change things around and make choices like that. But the problem here is that the increased incoherence of this kind of choice makes the LARP hard to understand and sometimes hard to improvise in because you don't understand just the very simple social rules that uh, already require some coherence. There's less sense of consequence and less sense of meaning because uh, you don't understand the context so well anymore. I had some trouble coming up with a great example of uh, this type of LARP, so I will use this one. Uh, it's a game I did with Eric Fatland and Mikke Pohjola in uh, 2006. And, uh, and in this game, the there was a very vague setting, almost like no world at all. But what was there was that uh, group A of the players were, uh, I think, mental patients in an asylum, and group B were angels. So there's this very vague idea of a world with maybe an asylum and, I don't know, heaven, angels, something like that. So obviously these characters were in the play game put into a shopping center to just harass people and that uh, later on to an underground ice hockey hall. And uh, as you can see, the sort of the connect there's no connection between what happened in the game, the shopping center, the ice hockey, and the vague world ideas we had. It just doesn't, there's nothing, nothing to do with each other. So we had, I think, a zero amount of loyalty to the, the little bit of world we had. But uh, at the same time, of course, we had a lot of uh, really strange uh, game mechanics which were completely unchained by any ideas of the world whatsoever. I think you can also do this in a good LARP, which this was not. <laughs> but, uh, but I couldn't think of an example of how to do that. So uh, I think that in this case, most I think the Halathisar and, uh, and uh, Celestra are more typical examples of how, how this goes. That the fader is usually in the middle, there can be many different kinds of compromises and many different kinds of conceptions of what uh, realism or plausibility, what uh, playability means in each case. And I think it's very important to sort of think about what is the what is the sort of focus, what is the substance of the game, and uh, and go with that because that affects very greatly like where where this kind of uh, failure can be. Thank you.